Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I believe we can, we can start now on our session, uh, which is the one on actions or initiatives of African governments to expand social protection during COVID-19. Okay, let me start first with um, a self-introduction to introduce myself. My name is Simon Nongo. I am the chairman of the Zimbabwe Social Protection Platform and also a representative for Southern Africa uh, with uh, Africa uh, Platform for Social Protection based in Nairobi. Um, my last um, full-time job was as UN resident coordinator in Namibia and that was way back over 10 years ago. Okay, the, the structure of this series, for those who, have, who are attending this for the first time, is um, that there are three components. The first component is voices of Africans affected by the COVID-19 crisis. And this was this was dealt with last week on the 1st of June. The second component is the actions or initiatives of African governments to expand social protection COVID-19. And this is going to be the part of our uh, meeting today. And the third one will be Africa's vision to expand social protection and build forward better for, from COVID-19. Um, let me start off with a summary of uh, the last session before we get into our current session. We had a keynote presentation by a colleague from AU, uh, which uh, framed our discussion accordingly. Then we had voices of children, informal workers, and an older person from Malawi. And they gave us their experiences as well as the coping strategies that they have had to adopt uh, to cope with the COVID-19 problem. The coping mechanism uh, comprised um, coping with lack of income uh, in one way or another to enhance the, uh, to augment the income of the family. And children had to, had to get involved in child labor. And unfortunately, there were cases of child abuse and violence because of the COVID-19 uh, crisis. The informal workers had to find ways of coping because they lost their informal uh, income earning capacity. The elderly also experienced all those, uh, uh, all those uh, similar, similar problems. And since there's no social protection for them, they have had to find ways of coping one way or the other. Children had to do with one meal a day uh, since there was not enough income to have three meals a day. Uh, the same with uh, informal, uh, informal workers. The elderly were passionately asking for assistance to augment their income uh, so that they could start income generating uh, projects. At the end of the session, um, we, we, had, we had a summary and reflections from Frederick Ebert Foundation and also a question and answer session which was done by uh, Save the Children. 
Now, let me start by introducing the guest speakers and presenters that we are going to have today. The first speaker is going to be Dramani Bachabi from ILO, the ILO Decent Work Team for West Africa. Then we will have John Gachigi, the Director of the Department for Social Protection, Ministry of Labor and Social Protection in Kenya. Then we also have Apera Iorwa, National Coordinator in the National Social Safety Nets Coordination Office in Nigeria. We will also have Dr. Gift Dafulea, uh, who is a prominent member of the Southern Africa Social Protection Experts Network. You'll be speaking from Johannesburg. Then we'll also have Carol Agengo, the Africa Regional Representative of Help Age International. I would also like uh, to thank our facilitators, Florian and everybody else that are guiding this, this process. So, after introducing the guest speakers, it is my honor to ask for the presentation of an overview by our ILO colleague, Mr. Dramani Bachabi. Mr. Bachabi, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Director. Good afternoon, good morning, everybody. Let me please uh, share my screen for presentation. Okay. Is it okay? Can you hear my presentation, please? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. So it is my pleasure to make this presentation on behalf of ILO. The presentation will be uh, structured in uh, three main points. The social protection situation prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, social protection and the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, some few elements on how we can build back better social protection system in Africa. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, the social protection coverage was very limited worldwide, especially in Africa where less than 18% of the population enjoy social protection. And uh, there are significant disparities across the continent Northern and Southern Africa have uh, relatively high coverage, but in the over subregion, the social protection coverage was very, very limited before the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, across the social protection benefits, there are significant gap regarding child and family benefits, maternity benefits and unemployment benefits. So these are the main function, the main benefit where Africa has to do better to protect people regarding the social protection contingencies. The main uh, causes of this uh, limited coverage, social protection coverage in Africa includes the need for a right-based approach the right for social protection is not yet a reality in Africa. And in many countries, the social protection program are not in core in legislation. So this is one of the, the root causes. The second one is about uh, the financing aspects. There are underfunded, underfunding of social protection system. And you can see, according to ILO estimation, the gap, the financing gap for providing a social protection floor, including health in Africa, is about 8.5% of GDP. So 
there are much to do for creating more fiscal space for financing social protection in Africa. Another one uh, root causes of this limited coverage is about the coverage of people in informal and rural sector, including migrants and some minority groups. The existing uh, social protection programs in Africa are not well adapted for workers in informal economy. So we have to develop some adapted mechanism, tool and procedure so that people in informal and rural economy can be covered by existing social protection system. There are also in uh, many countries a weak governance and administration system of social protection and an absence of policy and institutional coordination. So as you can see in this uh, intro introduction, the social protection in Africa remain very, very limited. And in this context of uh, limited coverage, country were forced to implement urgent measures to mitigate the impact of the social uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So as you can see, in many countries, new programs were implemented to mitigate the impact of social COVID-19 pandemic. But most of uh, this program were implemented through non-contributory mechanisms. About 64% uh, of uh, new programs were implemented through non-contributory mechanisms. This means that uh, countries were obliged to create new fiscal space, new funding to support population affected by COVID-19 pandemic. In Africa, nearly all the countries were able to implement or announce social protection measures against COVID-19 pandemic. I think this is a, a good news. And uh, most of uh, the social protection measures implemented in African countries were through non-contributory mechanisms. Only 13% of uh, social protection measures were implemented through contributory mechanism. And about 60% of uh, program were new program. So this is an evidence that uh, in Africa, we do not have strong social protection mechanism in place. So government were obliged to design, adopt social protection mechanism to mitigate the socioeconomic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. What are the lessons that we can learn from, uh, from this uh, COVID-19 pandemic? The first one is about uh, people in informal economy. Most of them were not covered by existing social protection program. So country try to implement some new mechanism, new approach, so that those people can be reached by existing social protection mechanism, by relaxing eligibility criteria, by using uh, new technology and so on. So the main challenge in uh, extending social protection in Africa is how we can implement some adaptive mechanism for people in informal and rural economy. So I was talking about the main lesson. Uh, the main one for me is that uh, country with a strong health and social protection system in place can quickly react and expand or adapt their program to mitigate the socioeconomic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we should together join our force so that African country can design and uh, strengthen the existing social protection system so that we can be able to react quickly in case of a crisis like a COVID-19 pandemic. So there are other main uh, lessons that can be learned from this pandemic, but the main one is that uh, we should work on building strong social protection system in our country. And in this regard, we think that uh, ILO two-dimensional 
strategy for extending social protection coverage can be used as a, a global framework for building better. And this uh, two-dimensional strategy ask, recommend to country to extend the coverage of non-contributory mechanism because most of uh, social assistance program, safety net program have very limited coverage currently. So the first thing to do is how to extend the coverage of this non-contributory mechanism. The second one is uh, to extend the social security system by adapting the social insurance to worker in informal and rural sector because they are the middle missing. So how social security institution can adapt the mechanism so that they can cover worker in informal and rural economy. So I think based on this uh, global framework, African country can start discussing implementing mechanisms so that we can build back better. And some few elements, develop comprehensive social protection policy and strategy through national dialogue to have a comprehensive social protection system in Africa, increase the fiscal space for social protection by improving the efficiencies and the reallocating government expenditure by creating new revenue through taxation and so on. So there are some options for creating fiscal space for social protection. The extension of social security to informal economy and rural sector by extending social insurance through contributory complemented by uh, tax financing benefits. And I think across uh, Africa, we are having some good practice on how social security can be extended to work in informal and rural economy. There are some good practice from Rwanda, from Kenya, and from other countries where social security institutions are extending their coverage to work in informal economy by extending the legal coverage, by removing the administrative barrier, and by strengthening incentive for formalization. So now I think in the continent, we have some good practice on how we can extend social insurance to workers in informal economy. Designing and implementing effective and sustainable social assistance program with some coordination with active labor market policies. This is very important. And the last point is improving social protection for migrant workers. So Mr. Moderator and dear friend, these are the few elements I wanted to share with you on behalf of ILO. So we can see that uh, African country were able to react quickly and implement some ad hoc mechanisms to mitigate the social economic impact of COVID-19. Now the question is how we can build on this ad hoc mechanism and strengthen our existing social protection system so that in case of a future crisis, we will be able to react quickly and protect people. So thank you very much for your attention. Over. Thank you very much, Mr. Bachabi, uh, for that um, very comprehensive and uh, clear uh, presentation. I'm sure uh, many of us are going to be able to uh, draw from your insights, the very profound insights which you have, uh, uh, which you have presented. Um, I, I'm also sure we're going to get a summary of some of these uh, strategies, policy strategies, uh, towards the end when we get uh, another colleague to do the summaries. It is now my pleasure to call upon a colleague from Kenya, uh, Mr. John Gachigi, the director of uh, uh, state in the State Department for Social Protection in Kenya. Mr. Gachigi, please.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me in this conference. And I would like to pick from what the previous speaker, Mr. Bachabi, have finished. And I would like to share the experiences and good practices in the provision and expansion of the social protection in Kenya, and more specifically during this period of the COVID. I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, but I have some talking notes which I'll be sharing with you. The first point is to mention that in Kenya, we have got a very well developed social protection systems for providing and pro, pro, pro expanding social protections for our poor and vulnerable. And we are normally guided by our national social protection policy. The first policy was developed in 2011. And in 2019, we were able now to review that, that policy based on the, the emerging issues. So in order now for us now to provide these social protection systems, we are working under four pillars. The pillar number one is the income security. In the income security, we have got the contributory social security programs and non-contributory <laughs> social security programs. This is where for the non-contributory, we have the cash transfer programs. In Kenya, we have got four, four cash transfer programs which are given to our poor and vulnerable and they target about 1.33 million beneficiaries who benefit on monthly cash transfer. The second pillar is on social health insurance, whereby at Kenya, we are also implementing the universal health coverage. Currently, we have been managed to pilot in four counties, regions, and now we have rolled up in all over Kenya. And we want to provide universal health coverage to all the Kenyans. And for the social protection beneficiaries, we are also linking all our beneficiaries to the NHF cover, and it will be non-contributory because the government will be contributing on their behalf. That we have also the shock responsiveness program whereby we are, which is aimed at responding to the disaster, disaster mitigation and responses, whereby we are now targeting the, our communities who are in arid and semi-arid areas and they are prone to the disaster. Also the same, same groups, we are also providing with the cash transfer and also during the drought and other emergencies, instead of giving them food or provisions, we have also opted to give them cash transfer so that they can make a choice on how they want to spend that money. And then finally, in order now to complement our social protection programs, we have realized that cash transfer, cash alone cannot remove people from poverty. So we have come up with a cash plus agenda. And within the cash plus agenda, we have come up with the complementary programs which are supposed to augment and complement what we are giving as cash transfer. And with that one, we want to promote the livelihoods of our beneficiaries or our citizens through and also through economic inclusion programs. So on that one, we have got a nutrition-based program which is targeting those children which are between zero and two years. We also have come up with an economic inclusion program whereby we want to empower our beneficiaries so that they can learn financial literacy and also be able to start income generating activities whereby we also want to graduate them from the program. First of all, we train them, we give them a top up cash transfer and then we graduate them with an asset. Once we graduate them with an asset, you'll be able to, to be sustainable. The other point I would like to emphasize is how did we respond to the COVID? When COVID came, the government put a number of measures to caution our poor and vulnerable. Mission number one is that for the current Inua Jami, for the current beneficiaries, the government continued providing them regular cash transfer on a monthly basis. And for the entire period during the, the, the COVID up to now, we have been giving our beneficiaries the cash transfer, and we have an annual budget of about 296 million US dollars. So 296 US, 296 million US dollars. That is the money we are giving to our, our beneficiaries. And among these beneficiaries, we have got about 833,000 who are senior citizens. These are senior citizens who are 70 years and above. And our program for the senior citizen is a universal program whereby we register anybody who is 70 years and above. And then number two, 
We also responded by government coming up with an emergency program for for the, for emergency program for the non for the for the new vulnerables. When COVID came, it brought up new vulnerables who are not covered. So for the new vulnerables, the government allocated 100 million US dollars to support those new vulnerables, those who had lost employment, and we were able to cover about 336 households who are receiving regular cash transfer payment on a weekly basis. This for the new vulnerables, they were able to receive money for 10 months on a weekly basis, which was very good because it was able to support them when they were hardly hit. And then for our beneficiaries who are persons with disability, the government also came up with a program and you were able to provide about 2 million US dollars, which was given to about 33,300 persons living with disability, and they were able also to be cautioned. With also the support of the development partners uh, and also other agencies like World Food Program, UNICEF, European Union, and a consortium of NGOs led by Red Cross, Care Kenya, and also Give Directly, we were also able now to come up with the design uh, some other interventions, which were both vertical and horizontal. For the vertical ones, they were able now to target the, uh, the regular beneficiaries, whereby they were able to give them top up allowances. And then for the horizontal, we were able now to target new vulnerables who had not who were not covered by the by the by the, in the regular cash transfer. And then during this period of the, the COVID. What did we come up with new? What are some of the innovations which we came up with, which enabled us to, to respond as quickly as possible without having our beneficiary uh, feel the, the major impact? Number one, because we did not have a database of all our poor and vulnerable, we adopted a multi-agency approach to register and target our beneficiaries. And using the multi-agency approach, we were able to bring different ministries, different government department, and we were able to use the structures which are there. And we use the structures which are at the up to the village level, whereby the elders at the village level, they are the ones now who are identifying those households who are, who are, who are, who are hard hit. And then we are able now to, within one week, we are able to bring that data in our system and we are able to respond to them. And then number two, we opted now to give them cash transfer. So all those new vulnerables, because still they were not in the system and they could not, uh, we, we could not provide them food or other things, we opted to give cash transfer. And we found it was very, very, very effective because the money we are giving them on weekly basis, they were able to buy food and other, and other requirements. The other thing is that we are also able to modify our payment delivery systems. Our, the no, normal de payment delivery systems is through the bank account, whereby our beneficiaries are paid through the bank account. But during this period of the COVID, we opted now for the mo mobile money transfer platform, whereby we were able now to transfer money using the mobile money transfer. And in Kenya, we have got the, the M-Pesa. We, we call it the M-Pesa. And this one was very improved because within a matter of minutes, the beneficiaries were able now to receive the money, and they were able to spend, and we were able to get reconciliation promptly on how, well, those ones who have received the money and those ones where the money has, has bounced. And then finally, we also came up with economic stimulus programs. These economic stimulus programs were whereby the beneficiaries were provided like food vouchers and other money, then they were attached to households and thereby they were able now to receive the, the, the food and that way now we were able to increase the consumption and also we were able also to, brought, to, bring, to bring growth. So what about what are some of the success factors which has translated well in Kenya within the, our social protection systems? Number one, we have come up with a, a very improved targeting system. And we have come up with a harmonized targeting methodology and harmonized targeting tool for using during the targeting. And this tool now we are using it across the board. Even the Ministry of Health, they are using the tool when they are targeting for the universal health cover and, and the Ministry of Agriculture, they are using the tool maybe for food security and all those things. And we have been able to digitalize that tool and you are using mobile application. So we are hoping that if now moving forward, and maybe if we have now another emergency like COVID, now with this tool which you have already tested and it's working, we will be able now to register our beneficiaries within a short time and also less support. At the same time, we're also coming up with the enhanced single registry. Previously, we had a single registry which had data for all our point vulnerable. But now this, but those ones for the beneficiaries. Now we want now to come up with a social registry. 
within the social registry, we want to target all the poor and vulnerable people in Kenya. And then we have that database. And then on a regular basis, maybe after two or three years, now we will be updating that data. So that may be in the future, if we want to come up with any intervention or if a, a partner want to de design a program, they only go to that social registry database, they mine the data and then they design the program. So that is what we are planning to do. At the same time, we also have got a very good robust grievances and case management system, whereby now we are able now to respond to all the grievances or beneficiaries, we are able to update data and also we are able also to do change management in our system. And that one has really improved us. And then finally, we have been able also to do, to do the deepening of the delivery systems, whereby all our, all our payment system are, are digitalized. We don't pay manually, they are digitalized through bank account and also the, the, the mobile money platform. Finally, I have some parting shots. One of them is that in Kenya, we have come to realize that social protections is very, very important. And we have improved, uh, we have emphasized to the government the everybody else that they need to invest on social protection. We need to invest on our poor and vulnerable. And it is important for people to know that when you are using money for the poor and the vulnerable, you are not, it is not a cost. It is not an expenditure, but it is an investment whereby we are investing on our poor and the vulnerable. And then at the same time, within our new now policy, which we have come up with, we are now moving from targeted programs now to the life cycle approach, whereby we want now to bring everybody on board. And we have started by the coming up with universal programs for the 70 plus, it's already there, covering even 70 years and above. And now we also want to pilot our one for the, for the universal child benefit. So starting end of this year, we want to pilot where we, we can have a universal child benefit for the child who are between zero and two years. And that's also going to be universal, will not be targeted. And then finally, we also want to come up to introduce some behavioral sciences in our cash transfer programs, whereby other than also be, be giving the, the cash transfer, we also want to, 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 to change the mindsets of our beneficiaries. We tell them that, yes, it is true that you are receiving the money, it is your entitlement, but that entitlement should come with a responsibility. So we want to train them on how they can be able to spend that money responsibly, and that way they will be able now to spend that money, they spend, use part of that money, maybe for saving and starting some income generating activities. Finally, finally, we are now sitting down with our development partners, other government agencies to design a post COVID recovery program whereby we want to come up with the, the interventions to support the poor and the vulnerable who are adversely affected by the adverse effect of the COVID-19. Thank you and over. Thank you. I'm on your own mute. Sorry. Thank you very much, uh, uh, John. And um, that was uh, like the last presentation. The, this was, uh, uh, this was a presentation filled with a treasure trove of many innovations that have been adopted in Kenya including the cash plus agenda, uh, the uh, uh, enhanced transfer systems, which include use of the Impesa modality uh, to make sure that uh, the payments are timely, uh, because like any income distribution or income, uh, income payment system, if, um, uh, if a beneficiary misses even for one month, that uh, completely destabilizes their system. So there are going to be a lot of insights that we are going to derive from this, uh, from these presentations. Thank you very much, Mr. Gachiki. Welcome. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Now it is my pleasure uh, to ask uh, our honorable presenter from Nigeria, um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Apera Iorwa, uh, to make his uh, presentation. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a third presenter, if I could be advised beforehand uh, so, that, uh, so that we can prepare. So it is my honor to ask um, Mr. Apera 
Iorwa, the National Coordinator for the Social Safety Nets Coordination Office in Nigeria. Your turn, sir. Um, thank you very much, uh, Simon, um, and my, the rest of my colleagues. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'll just quickly try to share my screen here. Um, mm -hmm. I think this is it. Yeah, brilliant. Um, live. Um, so good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me again. Um, as you've been told, uh, the name is Yowa Apera. I'm the National Coordinator of the National Social Safety Coordinating Office. Now, under the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management, and Social Development in Nigeria. Um, so, I'm I'm happy to be here to talk about the Nigerian experience uh, around the COVID-19. But first, let's uh, just to bring some context uh, or background to the Nigerian situation. Uh, first, uh, Nigeria it's a country with 200 million plus people. Uh, four out of every 10 are below the poverty line. As of the last count in 2020, at uh, the outbreak of the pandemic, uh, where Nigeria was around 203 million people, 82.9 uh, million were estimated to be under the poverty line as established by the National Living Standards Survey conducted by the Bureau of Statistics in 2009. Now, that situation, of course, and the pandemic motivated the country to look towards the expansion of social protection programs in the country, and particularly the National Social Protection, the National Social Safety Net Program, which is a flagship uh, program on social protection for the country to not only establish uh, systems and structures for social protection implementation, but also build the National Social Register. And through the Economic Sustainability Plan, which was developed under the leadership of the Vice President with the relevant ministries, we then hatched the program that I'll be talking to in the next slide. But first, just to state that Nigeria has a single registry called the National Social Register. Currently, as of today, that register stands at 8.2 million poor and vulnerable households made up of 13 five million individuals. So if you look at the estimate of all those living below poverty line of 82 million, we have approximately 40-41% uh, already registered in the single register. But the single register, it's not from the rural, we, we, we take it from the poorest communities. And so as at the time the pandemic broke out, we had uh, the registry, um, looking more from the rural communities who are most poor and vulnerable. But the Mr. President then directed the expansion of that register and also to look towards the urban poor who were most impacted by the pandemic. So today I'm gonna to narrow down on our efforts uh, at targeting the urban poor uh, to share this experience with you. Um, Um, hello. Yeah, hello. Can you hear me? Um, uh, can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, Simon. Can you I can hear you. Okay. I can hear you. Now. I I lost uh, I lost contact for a few for a few seconds. Okay. All right. Um, perhaps I was just struggling with the technology as the slide are not moving from my end. But um, right. I, Please I'll proceed. Speed up. Okay. Brilliant. So the director, Mr. President, was to horizontally and vertically expand the social register to include new beneficiaries, uh, but particularly targeting the urban poor. Um, and the goal was to reduce poverty and economic vulnerability by building a sustainable system. Uh, we looked at the COVID-19 as a huge, huge opportunity to build what uh, could be Nigeria's 
uh, shock responsive uh, social protection structures and systems, not only to attend to the pandemic's issues and challenges, but be ready to be activated very quickly uh, for uh, other economic shocks man-made or uh, natural in, in the future. And so what we did primarily was to then design what we call the rapid response register uh, for COVID-19 cash transfer program. And the rapid response program, working with the, our partners, the World Bank, to, uh, uh, for systems to um, support um, the rich uh, to the urban poor, uh, with sets of livelihoods and other uh, form of interventions during the pandemic and beyond. What we did was then thinking through this, uh, we then looked at how to design a targeting system that was purely scientific and also a payment system that was digital actually, uh, that will be doing a purely scientific-based targeting system pushed up to the digital payment, so electronic end-to-end, -end, if you say. So the first process was first to establish what the urban political worlds were in the country. Nigeria is made up of 36 states, and the federal capital F uh, FCT, which is equally a state, you put it at 37 states, made up of 774 local governments, 8,799 political worlds. And out of these political wards, 2,650 of them are urban, while 6,149 were rural. And working and using certain um, databases, uh, big data, we're able to then narrow down uh, to 1,163 poorest urban political was targeting a total of 20 million uh, people. And then we adjusted or tweaked our data capturing checklist for the social register to capture only 43 important variables for the rapid response because it's a rapid response mechanism and so we reduce the data sets from in the social register the total data sets per household it's about 1136 uh, indicators but so we tweak that to only 43 important variables for the rapid response register so you see satellite technology and satellite imagery uh, and aligning that with big data, machine learning algorithm, we were able to categorize our political world uh, first from the uh, urban political world, but also from the poor to the poorest urban political world. And then we categorize, we categorize those from the first to the 14th category. Uh, as you progress from uh, one, it's the poorest urban political world uh, to the 14th, which is the poor political world. And based on the resources that we had and the targeting, we took the first seven uh, poorest urban political worlds that amounted to 1,163 urban political worlds, uh, and we're targeting 20 million uh, people in the rapid response register. The next image I'll browse to very quickly, but this shows uh, the satellite imagery for the country uh, with the sparsely uh, uh, populated area, which are rural. The second image, uh, the more, more dense, uh, closely knitted uh, settlements for the urban poor, uh, the other urban areas, and of course, uh, uh, the more uh, urban uh, areas as indicated uh, on your screen. Now, with that categorization, like I told you earlier, uh, we're able to categorize from the poor to the poorest. So the first uh, poorest 5%, uh, like you see, the political words are, are sparsely uh, uh, populated as indicated on the map to your right. Uh, so we took the middle ground, which are the urban political words that we pick around the country, also answering the very uh, touchy question on the political dynamics of the country, wherein uh, whatever we do, uh, will most reflect the entire tax states of the Federation and the FCT. So this gave us coverage around the entire country. 
Now, the process of the rapid response register then becomes for those political ones that we have mapped the com com communities using broadcast, ma uh, broadcast mass for each of those communities. Isolated, we will send text messages through this broadcast mass. In individuals targeted urban poor living in those communities whose phones are attached to those broadcast mass for those communities will then respond to the text message. Once the text message comes to us, we we'll synthesize the data and then we match it against the already uh, the single register that we have so that we are able to separate those who are already in the social register and those who are new beneficiaries. So once we separate that, we take the information, the data from each of the respondents back to the states, the 36 states and the FCT, gotten from the SMS and take additional information populating the 42 uh, indicators in the rapid response register uh, uh, database and register these people onto the database. Having done that, we undertake our quality assurance, including the back checks ATC, assuring ourselves we will then develop out of that a payment schedule that will then be paid. Uh, the payment schedule will then pay the beneficiaries direct to their bank. So what we did, since this is a first time technology in our country, we piloted it in two states of the FCT in Abuja. When we piloted this in the FCT, which is the federal capital, 29,000 beneficiaries registered successfully, even though we had more than that eight. And in Lagos State, which is the, one of the most popular states in Nigeria of close to 17 million individuals living there, we had about 10,000 because our pilot was only in two political worlds. But then we had about 73,000 responses outside of these two states. Now, informing some of the studies that we will, we, we, uh, some of the lessons that I'll discuss later. But the, the slide by your right indicates very clearly that we could monitor them because it was the use of technology. We could monitor the inflow of responses coming from the field on a daily basis and on a minute to minute uh, basis, which was really good for us to gauge the responses and also uh, connect with the state teams in to intensify campaigns in other communities that we were not seeing responses from. That way we were able to have 100% coverage in all of the communities that were targeted in the pilot. Now, before you, of course, shows, um, uh, the records we received 11,000 when we matched it with the NSR, about 1,000 dropped, and then we had in total 10,000. But in the, the, the graph before you shows one the perception of uh, beneficiaries. So when we did this, we included one or two questions that tell the 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 the, 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 the efficacy or otherwise or the acceptability of this technology enhanced. Uh, a system for our beneficiaries. And so 78% were glad. 21 felt it was a fraud. Uh, and then the other one uh, they didn't believe in it. But this thing all showed us what we could do uh, in improving when we scale. And then the next slide says the dis distribution of bank accounts. So when we're doing this validation, we also took the bank accounts of these beneficiaries so that it then enables us to pay directly to the beneficiary. Like you see on your on the screen before you, uh, a, a considerable number of the beneficiary would be beneficiary had bank account, giving us an average of 78% of those who had bank account. So with the lessons learned and with the figure. What happened is on the day on the 19th of January 2021, uh, uh, 2021, the Vice President of Nigeria launched the Rapid Response Register for COVID-19 cash transfer program for the country. And when he clicked the button online, 3,155 beneficiaries got cash, 5,000 5, each in their bank account, which demonstrates the efficacy of the technology enhanced targeting, scientific targeting process, and the electronic payment system. With this, we had the confidence to now scale. But first, the lessons uh, from that pilot. We knew it was very important to bring the telecommunications on, on board. 
because without that, we were not able to isolate the text messages to specific communities. And that is why you saw in the previous slide that about 73,000 of the text messages went out of the catchment area or the targeted area. So bringing the telecommunications on board, having them code each of the telephone uh, masks that were targeted in each of the community will enable us ensure that the text messages go only to those telephone masks and the responses could only come from them since they were coded. Anything outside of that gets straight out, filtered out as the non-targeted areas. That way we're able to sort of hone in on the targeted places that we wanted. It then also meant that uh, the no response that we had, only 10,000 or so men that we needed to intensify campaigns uh, and a massive engagement with the media houses for the scale. And that is exactly what we have done. With around this is a strong grievance redress mechanism because one of the lessons we learned was that we had over 6,000 complaints in a pilot that lasted for only one month. And so it meant that we needed to adjust our grievance redress mechanism to be able to handle the traffic. So we have now developed the, what we call the cost certain center, where we all, all calls, text messages, voice enabled uh, messages comes to this cost of the center and the automated responses for the more frequently asked questions. But the non frequently asked questions are immediately flagged to the GRM managers at, a state, at the national level who filters it to the state and the state to the LGA levels and to the GRM volunteers who will deal with it and give feedback uh, to the complaints, with either through calls or physical visits if, it's, if it is that challenging. However, within each of the community, we have established community neighborhood centers using neighborhood uh, associations. Lead, leads or GRM leaders that will help sort of navigate through the complaints and the settlement and uh, all those complaints in a way and manner that will be satisfactory to, the, to our food. And so we have scaled the program. Starting last week, nationwide, we are doing it in state because the telcos also inform us that if we send text messages all at once across the country with that huge uh, population, it would clog the system and slow down the system. And so they advise and work with us to batch the SMS by a stages of three uh, categories. So the first batch of states, as you see before you, we have deployed the USSD code that we got specific for this program. We have a total hit of 276,000 as at yesterday evening. That is after uh, uh, three days of deploying to the first uh, six, uh, 12 states, 276,000 hits, uh, whereas uh, 165,000 uh, beneficiaries have successfully completed uh, the first stage of uh, the registration of the targeting process. The next, of course, shows you uh, the, 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 the hits state by state. So we are able to gauge this by the minute it has the text messages are coming in as the USSD completed uh, forms are coming in. We can gauge it. And this way is helping us to determine okay, which state is doing well, which is not doing well, which state can we interface quickly with the state, for instance, Anambra. And you will know with the current situation in Nigeria, the agitation of uh, Biafra and the IPOP has slowed down activities in the Northeast. So you see Anambra and the Bonyi state are all from the Southeast. And you see that their numbers are a bit low from starting last week. There were a little bit of discussion in economic interactivities in that part of the country. So it did slow it down. But with, with the uh, now we are intensifying more campaign and more efforts. Hello. Of course, this is also we that run a very strong tracking and monitoring system. When we validate the data, we take the geo coordinates of each individual that in the rapid response register. 
Tayana. Hello? Hello? Yes, we can hear. We can hear. There was a slight disturbance. Please proceed. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Brilliant. So as I was saying, the program is with around a very strong tracking, monitoring, and citizen engagement and accountability strategy. First, for every beneficiary in the rapid response register, like it is in a single register, is geocoded. So we have their geo coordinates of their dwelling, their household, etc. That we enable easy tracking back check of this data to ensure uh, quality check and also to enable even previous to uh, track them. We are also using the party monitoring system for the civil society organization that enable them double check on the data that were collected and those that will be paid to a system. But overall, the rapid response register is sitting as a subset of the social register. The idea is post-COVID and post-COVID recovery, the state team will then go to each of these communities where we have already registered people on the rapid response register, validate that information through a community-based targeting system, and bring them fully onto the single social register wherein they will continue to uh, benefit from other social protection programs and initiatives of the government, uh, philanthropic organization, donor organization, and the private sector. Hello. Hello. Yes, we. We cannot get the, uh, yes, the sound. Yeah. Yes, it's um, the voice is breaking. Uh, I can hear you, but with some disturbance. Hello. I don't know where I okay, I don't Hello? know where I left uh, but if you can hear me now we'll just run the I can uh, I can I can hear yeah. you now intermittently. Hello Okay. I understand there is no audio for all Sorry. of us. Yes. Hello. Hello. Mr. Pera? Uh, Our facility does indicate that there are problems with the yeah, sound can system. You. Can you hear me? I can, I can hear you intermittently, though. Please proceed. Let's let's see if we can proceed. Mr. Perra? Mr. Perra, can you hear me? Hi, Karin. Is there something that can be done? Okay, so you can you hear me now? Simon? I can hear you now. I hear you. Oh, okay. Okay. Brilliant. I, I was just rounding up uh, okay. with my last slide. Yes. Um, I don't know if you had uh, you, uh, where you stopped, well, where you stopped um, hearing me. Um, but I was rounding up by saying that the rapid response register that I've just described, that we have also piloted and now we're at scale, is a short responsive tool and framework for expansion of social protection a platform to, to, for stimulating economy and lifting poor and vulnerable uh, uh, at crisis time. 
uh, for man-made or natural shock. The rapid response register will sit as a subset of the social register, thereby enabling us uh, a post-pandemic a recovery period to validate, further validate the information and bring them into the mainstream social register to continue benefiting for those who are uh, poor and vulnerable. Uh, it will, of course, uh, provide the evidence and the database to continue to uh, um, uh, pursue or develop our human capital development sector. Uh, it, will it does provide a sustainable framework that supports disaster risk response delivery system and shock responsiveness in the terms of emergencies. On that note, um, I want to thank you very much uh, for the um, opportunity. I'm not sure where you, the break happened and you missed it, but um, I'll be, I'm on hand to take uh, questions um, when the time comes. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Mr. Apera, uh, for that uh, very, uh, uh, very clear, other than the, apart from the uh, occasional loss of sound, but everything is, is um, uh, since we have this available, uh in uh, in writing uh thank you very much uh i think i could easily say that the hallmark of this presentation is uh, the level of uh, technological advancement uh, which is based on um, technology and rather on uh, satellite based poverty mapping uh, which has generated so much uh, so much sophisticated, to, so many sophisticated tools uh, for analyzing the uh, the poverty situation in the country, and um, and then also uh, helping devising means of um, uh, coping with any glitches in the system. Of course, the uh, uh, the principal element is the uh, rapid response. Uh, a rapid response register, uh, which is uh, additional uh, to the national register. And um, I think many African countries are going to learn a lot uh, from the level where you are in terms of technological advancement. Thank you very much, Mr. Apera. I'm sure we are not hearing the last of these, uh, uh, of these presentations. Uh, from Nigeria as well as from Kenya. Um, now, before we go to the next item uh, that is uh, available, uh, uh, that is already scheduled, I just wanted to know if there is any other national presentation that might have materialized in the meantime. I'm asking the uh, uh, our distinguished uh, uh, distinguished uh, facilitators. Hello, Karin. Okay. Can uh, can everybody hear me? I see Mr. Apera is uh, still online. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, I am. I can hear you very clearly too, yeah. Okay, you can hear me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so let me go to the next item uh, for presentation. Um, and if there is no other presentation, I'm going to ask um, Dr. Gift Dafulea from Suspen uh, to give us a summary and reflections on the actions of governments uh, that are, that can be derived from the presentations that have just been made, and um, and then we can proceed to the uh, uh, to the next segment of the uh, uh, of the webinar, uh, which will be the Q and A. So for the for the moment, it is my pleasure to invite Dr. Gift Dafulea. Uh, to make his presentation on the summary and reflections 
um, on what has been presented. Dr. Davulea, please. Thank you so much, Simon. And um, hello, everyone. Um, uh, I, I think so far we we have heard uh, that um, social protection has been used by the African governments to respond to to COVID nineteen, and I think for the first time the traction of social protection in Africa has been comparable to the rest of the world. From the ILO presentation, I could pick that uh, there were about 92% of responses emerging from the African governments and the world average was also at 92%. So th that's a significant traction in terms of social protection that we have never seen before. That basically tells us that there is something that we can leverage on moving forward. Uh, I think that's a biggest takeaway that I, I, I have seen. And from the case countries that were presented from Kenya, as well as Nigeria, we also have some key takeaways that I think I could quickly point out innovation. I think the governments have really tried their best to work with available technology to especially hasten or uh, put to speed the registration of new beneficiaries into the either existing programs when they needed to be horizontally expanded or in creating new programs. So that innovation has been, has been great. We have seen that uh, countries for the first time could register new participants using a cell phone, for instance, websites, emails, something that we're not seeing before COVID. We would see people being called to go and queue and do all the necessities but with the emergence of COVID and the responses from the government, we have seen this innovation that it's also possible to have the poor registered at the comfort of, of their homes. They don't need to travel distances just to be registered. So it's, it's something that is very encouraging that is emerging. Also, we have seen from Nigeria, the triple R that uh, they, they, they have engaged and also the use of, 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 of GIS to, to make sure that targeting is improved. So those are some of the innovations that um, are, are, are key takeaways, particularly uh, for me in terms of government um, responses. Overall, I think I, I, I can also say that uh, the African governments have um, used existing social protection programs to extend coverage uh, to new beneficiaries. Like we have at least 25 programs that are recorded as such that managed to increase coverage during COVID-19 so that the, either the cash transfers or transfers in kind, particularly in Botswana countries such as Botswana, reach out to beneficiaries that were not reached before COVID. In terms of shock responsive social protection, this has been referred to as the horizontal expansion of, of, of social protection. So we've managed to witness that and that is great. It shows the shock responsiveness of existing programs in the need that they need to escalate, particularly horizontal. In terms of increasing the amount of benefits given to beneficiaries, we have got few case examples, but they were there and 
they were temporal. Um, also, I think another big takeaway is, is, is that almost 64% of the responsive uh, of the responses from the government came from new programs. And these new programs took different forms. And we, we had several instruments that have been used and they've been tracked well by ILO, we have seen in their presentation. They have been also tracked well by IPCIG. Um, these instruments range from cash transfers that were so much now used to, particularly they are driven by the donors, save for in few countries where social protection is institutionalized. But we, we, we have seen African government introducing them on this occasion, stretching all the way to the subsidies. We all know that subsidies were almost a done deal. No one was talking about them. But with the emergence of COVID, we started seeing governments resorting back to, to subsidies. If not subsidies, they, 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 they introduced cost reduction measures on utilities, particularly water as well as electricity. We've got a minimum of 50 programs that were embarked as such in, in, the, in the African continent, particularly in the sub-Saharan continent. And, and that's also something to, 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 to take away from the responses of the African government. Then um, the, the last takeaway that I may want to, to, to quickly talk of before I, I say the implications of all this is, 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 is that, um, the, the, the new programs that have been introduced have been emergency programs. Most of them, they've either been once off, like once off emergency cash payment, or program will run for three months or for six months, but they, they are not permanent. And I want to start from that to talk about the implications of such responses in terms of moving forward. One, I think we, we need to quickly make sure that we don't conflate emergency assistance and institutionalized social protection. I think that is especially crucial for Africa because we may end up at a situation whereby we only introduce programs when faced with a huge crisis. Instead of having existing programs that can respond to a crisis. So it's a circle, but a very, very crucial uh, difference between the two. So what I see here is, we need to use these new programs to make an argument that it seems governments, where there is willingness, they are able to assist the poor or those, or those who are in need, right? But this needs not be a once off. It needs to be an institutionalized process, which can always be shock responsive should we face another crisis in the near future. So that's, that's one implication that is very, very key to me. The second one is the contagion effect of this. If you see how countries started to respond in terms of their uh, 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 measures towards COVID-19, you could see a sort of fire that was just catching up everywhere. And that's the contagion effect. Countries easily do some other measures of social protection when they see other countries that they think they are in the same basket with doing something. So we, we need to now start finding ways to build upon such a contagion effect 
to make sure that we institutionalize social protection. We move not only from uh, not only away from these emergency measures that we are seeing, which were many, but to also institutionalize them. We also need to realize this contagion effect. Uh, I'm not so sure how it can catch fire like the measures did catch fire when uh, the emergency assistance measures were introduced to deal with, with social protection. But that is very, very um, crucial. Then the the other thing that I, I, I'll just want to mention and then I stop is, is, is that we need to get the conversation of social insurance going as well. What we have learned from the responses uh, to COVID-19 is that the governments have had to step up, which is very good and it's their role, but we never saw quite a number of social insurance programs responding. You know, the nine class car risks that are meant to be covered, somehow they are to cover risks, which may include risks such as uh, the ones that we came from, from COVID-19. If we had such insurance measures in place, we would have risks covered. Such programs will respond to risk and cover people. But we, read, we had rarely uh, any of these measures. Why? Because in the first place, social insurance is still very, very minimal. And it's interesting from ILO how they have now conceptualized this to actually say, perhaps let us target the informal sector where the majority of people are, and we find ways in which they may have social insurance programs running to an extent that should risk strike, it then may cover them. I think that is, that is very crucial. And we're starting to see quite a number of programs uh, being innovated to extend to, 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 to the informal sector. We're seeing uh, Tunisia, for instance, having such programs. We have seen uh, also um, community-based health schemes being used where the governments, uh, like in the case of um, Tanzania, uh, if not Namibia, yeah, it's Tanzania where the government can actually top up what the communities also contribute. So we're starting to see those things and we need to leverage on them in, 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 moving, in, moving, in moving forward. And then lastly, I would think that social assistance still needs to, 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 to play also a huge role, particularly on the other groups of the life cycle that are not active. We have countries covering children as well as the adults. We also need to start seeing a lot of people with disabilities being covered. There's still a few countries that have cash transfers for the disabled. So we also need to see traction in that direction. I think with that, Simon, let me stop here and hand over to you. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dafleya. Um, to all the participants, I would like to say, uh, I wouldn't be exaggerating if I said, uh, Dr. Dafleya has, um, uh, really uh, reflected um, our appreciation of uh, the presentations and uh, in, a, in a more enlightened way than many of us would have, uh, uh, would have seen. And uh, I, I think a lot is going to come out of, uh, out of these presentations. And uh, it, is, um, it, is quite, uh, uh, it is quite consoling to notice or note that um, many African countries did step up to the plate when they were all hit by this uh, COVID uh, emergency or COVID crisis. And I don't think one would be misrepresenting the truth uh, to say that um, uh, there are a lot of things that are going to change uh, even or especially in Africa after this experience 
uh, of the uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Daflea, uh, for your uh, very clear and um, uh, well articulated uh, observations and also recommendations, particularly relating to social assistance as well as social insurance uh, that you have uh, recommended as potential institutionalized mechanisms or tools uh, to address uh, these problems. So thank you very much. Now we go to the question and answer session. And for this, I would like to invite Carol uh, to, uh, uh, to sub-moderate that um while uh, uh, while we are while we are listening i see that there are quite a few q and a's or rather there are quite a few queues that are already sitting in the bubble uh so please carol may you please uh, take over from this stage and then um, uh, get us to deliberate on that item thank you very much um thank you very much simon and good afternoon, everybody. Um, Carol Lagengo from Helpage uh, International, uh, working from Nairobi, Kenya. I'm the Africa Regional Representative. Uh, as Simon has said, there's quite a number of questions that have been posted on the Q&A uh, bubble, but I have seen that Brahman has been answering uh, these questions quite actively. There are some that remain unanswered, and these are the ones that I would like to uh, call out and direct to the presenters. Before I do that, I'll request Karine to kindly guide us in terms of time, uh, so that then we, uh, we manage our expectations. Uh, Karine, how much time do we have for this session? Oh, we are short, so we're going to take a few. I can see that uh, uh, Mr. Gachigi has also been answering um, quite a number of questions. So we have 17 minutes to answer the questions uh, and not more than that. So I will just ask, uh, direct a few, um, and they're quite well uh, directed as it were. The questions to Mr. Gachigi are mainly around how we, um, Kenya ensures that uh, the vulnerable people are, what's the criteria for selection? Number two, ensuring that those within the informal markets who do not have bank accounts are able to receive their cash transfers um, and the protection or rather the collaboration between the Kenya government uh, and other departments, um, and those are the ones related to the cash transfers. Uh, they cover uh, a range of other questions that have been asked in this regard, but there's one that is slightly different, which is the elements of Kenya's COVID-19 recovery plan and what if any uh, role the social protection would play in that plan. So those are the questions directed to Mr. Gachigi. Uh, and I'll give you five minutes to respond to them, and then we'll uh, move on to Mr. Pera. Mr. Thank Gachigi. you. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. So let me respond to the first question, which was the what the what condition would one need to to meet to qualify for the cash transfer programs? It is important to note here that in Kenya we have four cash transfer programs. Three of them are categorical categorical in the sense that the first one is offers and vulnerable children. So number one, you must be either a vulnerable child or, may, or maybe an orphan child, either single or double, and coming from a poor family, and you must be 18 years and below. So the second one is of persons with a severe disability. This is also another categorical program for persons with a severe disability. It's not persons with disability, but persons with a severe disability, those who require 24 hour care and support, and you must come from a poor family. And then the other category one is for the hunger safety net program. This one is implemented by a sister department. It targets the people who are in arid and semi-arid areas. They must be poor and vulnerable. Then the other question is, uh, how 
did the people in the informal sector who do receive the money for the cash transfer responses, and yet they don't have bank account. It is important to note that for the COVID response, we did not use the, the bank account. We used the mobile money platform to, to, to give the money. And in Kenya, in terms of penetration of the mobile, mobile connections, we have, we have penetration is 109%. 109%, I think it's one of the highest because we have got people who own more than two or three lines. Like myself here, I own like three lines. So that's why we are having 109 uh, penetration. Meaning that even those in the informal sector, even the poor and vulnerable in the villages, in the rural areas, majority of them, they have got the telephone lines, which they, they normally use. The other question is the, the criteria for the targeting to take, how, how do we normally do the targeting and ensuring that we have limited, limited exclusion and inclusion errors. So for the targeting thing, I said that we are using the harmonized targeting methodology. And under that one, we use two methods. Number one, we use community-based targeting, whereby we involve the members of the community to identify and also to, to do household listing to, so that they can support. And then after that, we subjected them the, to the proximity test, whereby we, we wait and then we target them based on the, the poverty levels. But that is for the two programs. But for the universal one, for the 70 plus, and also the upcoming one for the universal child benefits, that one is universal. We are not doing any targeting. We are just doing registration 100%. And therefore, that one does not have either exclusion or inclusion errors. The other question is about the elements of the COVID recovery plan. This one, it is still under discussions. It's still under the, the plan. But it is going to, 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 to use the, the multi-agency approach. It is also going to be multi-sectoral, whereby different departments, different agencies will come and they come with different interventions. And those interventions will also be targeting different categories of the people. It will target the farmers, the businessmen, the poor and the vulnerable, and the, everybody who has been affected. And also even the, the informal sector, the informal workers, the laborers, and all those. All of them are going to be, to be included in the post COVID recovery programs. And the, from our, the initial understanding is that social protection will play a very big role in, the, in, in this design. So that maybe even when it comes to the delivery, we use the system which they are, and especially using the cash transfers. And then in terms of the who support the social protections in Kenya, Kenya is unique another, like unlike other African countries whereby for all our social protection programs interventions, which we are talking about in 1.33 million beneficiaries, we have an annual budget of about 310 million US dollars which we normally use, 310 US dollars, which we normally give to the, to the people on, a, on an annual basis. All that money is 100% tax financed. We don't spend even a single penny from the donors to support our cash transfer beneficiaries. The only money we get from the revenue partners is for capacity building, for technical support, and then maybe for system strengthening. They support a lot on system strengthening. But in terms of the, 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 the cash transfer, 100% tax financed. And then finally, what are some of the negative consequences of our digitalization? Because we have used a lot of digitalization. What are some of the negative consequences? Some of them is that for you to be registered digitally, you must have an, an, an identification document. And that identification document, which is an ID, is subjected to other government agencies. And if that, that document, that ID has got issues, maybe like name mismatch, and maybe shared ID or something like that, you are knocked off from the system, you cannot join the system. The other hand is that when it comes to the mobile payment, we normally use the telephone lines, which is registered at a particular person. And for the mobile telephone companies to pay, three things must tally. Number one, the name, which is registered for that line. Number two, the line, which is registered, that is the number of the line. And then number three, the ID number. So if the name, the ID number, and the telephone line, they don't, ma they, they don't match, you cannot be paid, your money bounces back. And then and you realize that some of the people maybe they either use borrowed lines or maybe they use the lines for their sons and their daughters. And because of that one, you are not able to pay them, but you only advise them to register so that that one can, can, can carry. The other one is that in terms of maybe the, um, the, the data sharing, we, our data, we, it's not very much integrated. And also some of the data is very old. So now, now 
now putting that data into the digitizing that data, which is in our database, and part of it is old, it's archaic, then it's not integrated with other databases. It's a give us some charity when it comes out to the digitalization. But once now we finish doing the social registry and also doing the update of our current system, we'll now have an updated data and moving forward, we'll be able to deliver to the best of our ability. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gachigi. I think you've given very comprehensive uh, responses to your questions. Um, and uh, I believe there'll be opportunity to continue engaging with you uh, on the very interesting presentation you made. So I'll move on to Mr. Perrin, ask uh, the questions. If you've had a chance to look at uh, the chat, there are a couple of questions that have been directed at you. And uh, one is to the, the issue about satellite poverty mapping um, and whether there's a way that uh, this can then be translated uh, into action. The question was uh, cut short, but I think what Lilian Aboro probably wanted was uh, the link between uh, the satellite mapping, the technology and the actual. And uh, the other issue was in terms of um, strategic alliances, whether there are any ways of linking up with humanitarian action actors in fragile crisis affected settings. And then um, the final question that I'll direct it to you is there's the positive role of digital technology and uh, what you presented, but what are some of the negative consequences? Um, Mr. Gachigi has spoken to some of them. It would be good to hear your perspective as well. So Mr. Perra, you also have five minutes. All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, interesting question. So, um, the satellite mapping, uh, what has happened is that uh, with the use of the satellite mapping, we're able to uh, map communities in real time. In fact, the broadcast mass is up to 2.5 kilometer radius accuracy in terms of targeting the urban political world against every program. So in Nigeria, every all of our, our telephones, that's our cell phones, are linked uh, to a broadcast mass situated around the places, mostly our homes, because we, we, we look at the traffic, uh, I think the telcos look at the traffic more from the usage um, that are the, where you use your phone at most in, in towards the evening times or early morning times identify your homes or um, it, your lines are linked to each telephone mass within the community where you, you, you reside. So what we use the satellite imagery, um, we're able to identify those political areas, of course, using with big data, um, uh, big data and machine learning algorithm, we're able to point print. So it's purely a full 100% uh, scientific and it's translated directly on the ground. And we can actually, uh, on the Google Maps that we have, uh, pinpoint with the become using our job coordinates identify each and every household that is being identified through this process. And I'm happy to share further uh, information or write ups that we have had uh, on this subject in terms of the design, in terms of the results that we have uh, with uh, uh, the team, and that can share to all participants who are linked up here. Now, leaving this with humanitarian actors, this is clearly a shock responsive uh, framework for Nigeria now as it is. Having designed, having piloted, and now we are scaling, it sits squarely as a shock responsive framework for Nigeria to be adapted by humanitarian actors or any actor in terms of a crisis situation. But like you know, in our country, we've had the insurgence issues in the Northeast. Now we also have the bandits uh, and crisis now in the Northwest. So what we're doing is using the same uh, technology enhanced uh, targeting system uh, to extend the registry to the Northwest. Now that it's emerging very strongly. And we started this work in Zamfara State. As of today, that process of registered actually, uh, I think about, uh, 400,000 internally displaced persons into the social register. 
using technology, purely technology enhanced uh, methodology, not only the satellite imagery identifying very clearly uh, with facts on the ground and big data, the IDP camps and host communities, but also using uh, the app that's been developed to then capture uh, internally displaced persons and their host community onto a subset of the social register designed particularly for IDP camps and um, host communities. And the government is directing all partners actually to work with the government, the state teams, uh, using this instrument uh, to register internally displaced persons and the host community. Now, more recently with UNHCR, we have just entered an agreement with them to extend that to refugees, including non-Nigerians as well. We have a huge refugee corridor from the Cameroons of uh, people pouring into Nigeria, and we have those camps. And you see the satellite uh, enabled technology at, at the border areas of Nigeria, Cameroon, uh, to identify refugees and also extend that to the Nigerian plane. Now, the positives are that it is scientific, and we're able to sort of um, go over some of the dynamisms in our country. For all, all of us who know our country very well, we have a huge country, over 300 uh, tribes and ethnic groups uh, with all their complexities. Uh, to also for that solve this problem, we also have the issues of North versus South, East versus West, as opposed to other African countries. But the use of technology has put that to pay. So when we, we actually released the numbers we're targeting across states, a number of state governors actually approached the Honorable Minister, but she was able to show that satellite imagery and the technology enabled mapping. And that actually, they all agreed with it, that it is indeed fair and equitable. And if you look at the targeted numbers per state, I just oppose that with the total poverty head count of the country as released with Bureau of Medicine, which is a completely different entity sitting in another ministry. There is a huge coloration. In fact, with other databases that speaks to poverty in Nigeria, the satellite imagery enabled technology, it's a complete, complete, complete match of the dynamics of the poverty situation in Nigeria. And we're able to also prove that. The negatives, of course, are in the infrastructure. When you target through the SMS, there are many, there are some people that do not have cell phones. Now, when you use a fully technically enhanced from the pilot, we also notice that those with ordinary phones are not um, scientific phones, uh, we could not respond to it. So we now have to step down the technology a bit to adapt to ordinary cell phones, regular phones that everyone uses. Uh, to be able to also respond to it. But also, also notice that some people didn't have phones. So what we are doing is using neighborhood associations. So the neighborhood association, so for every settlement area, you have people from, say, uh, Lagos, who are domiciled or staying or resident in Kano. They'll have an association within that community. So the leaders of those neighborhood associations, leaders of associations like the Association of Artisans, Association of Tailors, Association of Bricklayers, all of those, we have identified, the state have identified their leaders. Using their leaders and advocates, we have identified them as a main entry for those who would not have access to home. The second thing is also access to bank account numbers. Like you saw in the pilot, 78% had bank account numbers, but the rest of them didn't have bank account number. What we have done to solve that is to enter agreement with banks that are most rich in each of the states of the federation. And they have agreed to give a virtual bank account to each beneficiary without the bank account number. In the, when we go to validate, and that is why the physical validation is also important. So when the state team are going to the houses to validate the information, they go with bank agents that give virtual bank accounts. And these banks have also agreed to to give them a virtual bank account that is linkable, that is linked to their main account. So if post uh, intervention, these individuals are going to continue with this bank account, it's very easy for them to change them to the regular commercial bank account wherein they also uh, are, are, are of, of benefit. Of course, this also, also keys into thinking of linkages, not only to humanitarian, but also government efforts. This links very clearly to the government uh, financial inclusion agenda. So that percentage 
of the beneficiary without bank accounts are also given automatic a virtual bank account that could be favorably adapted to a commercial bank account. So in doing this, we're also then creating those linkages, not only to government existing policies on financial, instru- uh, uh, financial inclusion, on a single ID system that becomes a unique identifier to the MNC, but also the use of pri- working with the private sector, i.e. the telcos. Now the database that we're also developing, the telcos are then using it to link up with the national ID number. Uh, which uh, it's uh, 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 um, uh, a project of a country. And of course, the lessons learned, which is of huge value to us, we have weaved okay, into Mr. a huge uh, Apera, we'll of need, of the system. Yeah, we'll thank need you. to wind down. Yeah, thank you very yeah. much. Um, unfortunately, our time is up, but uh, we'll be sharing the Q&A report after the webinar and speakers can uh, provide follow-up if needed. So thank you all very much, and I'll hand us back to Simon. Thank you very much, uh, Carol. I really appreciate your uh, uh, your uh, agility in handling the Q and A uh, session. Um, there's no way anyone else could have uh, could have done it while attending to other things, but you did it in a particularly uh, expert fashion, uh, which I appreciate very much. Thank you very much, uh, Carol. Um, we are now coming to the uh, closing uh, phase uh, of our uh, of our webinar, and uh, I really would like to say that uh, personally, I found I found the um, uh, I found the session extremely rewarding and um, it's um, uh, it's something that gives one hope uh, that there is going to be a possibility for Africa to at least um, uh, to at least cope uh, with the complexities of the uh, uh, of the uh, covid 19 crisis uh, probably better than many other many other countries uh, particularly in the in the developed uh, in the developed world uh, thank you very much we really appreciate uh, we really appreciate what has come out of this uh, the presentations were excellent and uh, the questions were very well informed and um, the uh, the analyses by our colleagues uh, from both ILO and also from Suspen were absolutely up to the, uh, even beyond uh, any, uh, any expectations. And what I would like to say at this point uh, is that while the presentations were uh, neither final nor, uh, uh, nor comprehensive or inclu- included everything, um, we um, we would uh, we would like as much as possible, uh, since these were not necessarily exhaustive, we would like as much as possible uh, to see more done, uh, not only in the next session, but also beyond uh, this phase of the dialogue. And uh, for that reason, I would like to challenge all the presenters and participants and the audience to share what we have uh, got out of this session and encourage um, uh, like-minded colleagues uh, to attend the next session and not only the next session, but also the future future programs that we are are going to, uh, uh, that we are going to have along the same, uh, along the same lines. So I would like to thank everyone uh, who has attended uh, this uh, this session uh, most uh, profusely, and um, uh, uh, thank you very much for your contributions. And uh, we we look forward to seeing you again uh, at our next uh, our next session, but also even the other phases that are going to follow this one. So thank you very much uh, to uh, to everyone. 
and um, we will now have to wind up. Uh, thanks a lot and um, all the best uh, wherever you are. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Simon, for okay. the facilitation Bye. and moderation. Thank you very much. This was uh, really excellent. Thank, thank you. you. Um, thank you, Simon, Hi, Mr. and everyone. Um, oh, it was indeed a pleasure for us in Nigeria to be able to join you and share our experience. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. We are going, all of us are going to learn a lot uh, from both Nigeria and, uh, and from Kenya. Uh, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of things to learn. Thank you. You're most welcome. Thank you. Good. Bye. Okay.